So I am a HPB oncologist. I've just been in a busy HPB clinic and uh, sadly seen two patients who've presented with advanced pancreatic cancer today. Um, and only last month I had eight patients in the clinic and seven of those had advanced disease and only one of them was being seen with curative intent. So behind those facts and figures and the absolute necessity to do that are patients presenting and uh, next slide please and although we've had dramatic inroads to many of our uh, clinical outcomes and improving outcomes and new therapies on the horizon um, sadly pancreatic cancer we've tried a lot of different things um, but but the the current key uh, trial that we have in metastatic disease is still novel treatments of, of, of novel combinations of chemotherapy. So this um, diagram just shows actually CAR T, which is showing some some promise in uh, solid tumours. Whether it will come to advanced pancreatic cancer, that may be the question. Uh, we also hear that cancer vaccines may be coming post surgery, um, and we're watching this space. But as Chris and everyone has said, we would much rather pick these cancers up earlier or in families with an inherited risk prevent it altogether and I think it is all our job and I challenge all of us now to get behind this and ask people the simple question of is there a family history um, and if so there really is no excuse not to, to mention Europac and consider referring. Um, so um, watch this space about improving treatments of patients with advanced disease or potentially after surgery. But as an oncologist, I think much more likely to be to make a bigger impact is this earlier detection of cancer. And I think this offers us a huge hope um, for, for many of us have been in the field for, for many years. Um, next slide, please. So I've just put a link into the chat of a video, and this is really about what you need to know. Um, and an amazing patient, Graham, who's sadly no longer with us, but he made this video for the Clinical Research Network. Um, and he was on the trial that I've just been talking about of uh, novel combinations of chemotherapy. Um, and he explains his his journey whilst having uh, taking part in a trial. Um, but sadly, as I said, although he did very well on the trial, he is no longer with us. Um, he presented with, with advanced disease um, and uh, all we could do was try and control the disease. So he explains one of the benefits of taking part in a trial, which I think hopefully we can um, ensure that anybody who's presenting with these type of cancers is offered a trial, but also the importance of um, telling patients and having conversations that research is ongoing and that we are trying to do better. And I think Europac, as I said, really offers hope, even when we're seeing patients with advanced disease, um, that there may be some help for their family and that a family member may be avoided, uh, may avoid um, the inevitable outcome that, that happens if you've sadly got stage four disease. So I really urge you to go and listen to Graham. Um, he actually, it, it isn't a depressing video, but it really explains what it's like to take part in research. Um, but also, sadly for Graham, he presented with ad advanced disease. So that really tells you about why I think we should take part in research and also what happens if you've got stage four disease. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of repetition, but I think it's really important for us all to know this isn't doing something special. This isn't a luxury add on. This is fundamental to what we're what we're what we should be doing um, and that there's nice recommendation out there that we should be looking for these patients and referring them on. Um, so that's just to recap. And I mean, Chris showed all those very fancy sort of algorithms and the, the amazing work that they've developed. But for us out here in secondary care or primary care, we don't have to even be as clever. All we have to do is have the courage to mention it and ask the question. So there's a real challenge for all of us, whatever your role, don't be frightened. Cancer genomics can be scary, trying to explain all those things that Chris mentions, but we don't have to do that. All we have to do is have the courage to ask and mention it, give them a leaflet, or um, even better, talk to one of the navigators and pass on their details. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, and as Chris mentioned, this has been open for a long time, um, but people have been self-referring. And that's all well and good, but actually what we are committed to do is reducing health inequalities and ensuring there's equity of access to research. So for those of you who are not familiar, do get familiar with the core 20 plus five framework. And this is again another thing that we should really be embracing and saying we want opportunities for all. Obviously people have the right to decline, but do not make assumptions that certain people or certain people from our communities do not want to take part in research. They do want to take part, they just might need some more time, some explanation, and just making sure that we are explaining it in a way that means that we are we are not hard to reach. Um, so just have a have a look at that. Um, and so that's really, really good that we that we want to ensure that we mention it and don't make assumptions about people. And then I think the next part was what do, what do we do next? So next slide, please. So um, all we need to do is just ask people. So this is hopefully full of multi-professionals. Don't be worried if you're the only one that's mentioned it. We're all very busy. Everyone's feeling overwhelmed, um, but it just takes a minute to ask. And you literally just need to say, do you have a history of pancreatic cancer? Or as I said to the lady last week who I met again today, do you have a history of pancreatitis in your family? I was not aware that pancreatitis um, or inherited pancreatitis risk was even a thing to my to my ignorance. Um, and I did, and she had two family members. So she's been put in touch with the navigator today. Um, and she's got family, siblings and children who um, I think will be eligible. Obviously, they need to go through the, the complex algorithm. But um, it just took me asking that question. And they didn't have a history of pan pancreatic cancer, but they actually did in pancreatitis. And I couldn't believe, I've just learned that, I've just asked it, and then they've referred them. Um, and then obviously, because we know there are associations with BRCA genes as well in pancreatic cancer, early cancers at a young age, uh, early breast cancers or um, ovarian cancers um, and, and Lynch syndrome and, and uh, so endometrial and colorectal cancers. But this is gonna become part of our normal conversation. Family history has always been part of a medical um, history taking, but now more than ever, we really need to brush up on how we do that. So next slide, please. Um, so where are we going to do it? Well, I just think we just do it everywhere. We just embed it into our conversations. So uh, primary care in the community, MDTs. So there's been a bit of question, oh, our MDT is very busy. I'm not sure that we can be picking up patients who might have a family history. I think we challenge that. Just as we've had Lynch syndrome uh, champions in our MDTs for colorectal and endometrial cancer, I think we need Europac and pancreatic cancer champions in our MDTs. Um, even if you're the most junior in the team, does it hurt to say, would they be suitable for Europac? Has anyone asked them about a family history? Um, you could really be changing, you know, a life and impacting on a family. Um, asking a new a patient appointment, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're an oncologist, whether you're in palliative care, and I'll just say a bit more about that in the moment. Um, all our nursing colleagues, they've been mainstreaming for Lynch syndrome um, and BRCA, and I would say this needs to be part of that conversation. It's everybody's business, it's everybody's job. Um, and we had a meeting, um, I think, with Emma and Chris a couple of weeks ago, and we were, and, and somebody said, but a lot of these people, I think it said up to a third of people, don't even get to see an oncologist. They go straight to palliative care. So I said, oh, well, maybe our palliative care colleagues should be asking at the hospice, and we've got an enhanced support team. Um, and within a week, I, t I sort of mentioned it to them. They'd spoken to a daughter, father very ill, um, but wants to take part, want to make sure that that doesn't happen to their to any more members of their family so um we we know that a lot of our patients sadly don't have active treatments but the opportunity for something good to come out of a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer do not underestimate it and even if someone's quite poorly we we know that they usually are happy from an altruistic point of view or from their family point of view they will take part and they will agree um so uh that, I just took that picture from the Pancreatic Cancer UK site, but it doesn't have to just be about people on active treatment because we know we'll miss out people on that. Uh, next slide. I think I've got 
two more. Um, so this is that we just did a meeting with our local clinical research network about are, are we hard to reach? Um, and this is Huda from AFI Health, part of our community engagement. And she was just saying, look, let's let's just get out there and engage with our communities um, and uh, don't make assumptions about who or uh, who who might or who, who might not take part in research. And then finally, my final slide, um, this is Graham when he went on a cruise, when he was taking part in his um, advanced cancer trial. Um, he always used to come and do something nice after his appointments with us, either go to the casino sometimes or go and have a meal. And then he went to a cruise. I think this was in Scandinavia. Um, so I really want to thank him for um, really showing me what it meant to look after a patient on a clinical trial and really, really amazing teamwork. Um, Sharon Short, who's my colleague who we've just been consenting patients for in clinic um, and our CTU, um, Chris and his team and also the national team, uh, Meg Vince Jones, who's our local PI here, Tracy Miles and the GLH and GMSA, because we're trying to um, look at a way of um, highlighting if people have got rare mutations that they might then be eligible. So somebody, we've we've entered somebody who had a rare mutation and a strong family history of cancer, um, making them much more likely and, and, and they've been referred. Um, and then our community partners. And finally, thanks to Lee um, for, uh, you know, reaching out to us and, and um, giving us this opportunity. I'm absolutely thrilled to take part. Um, and I know we're going to refer more people um, because it's just a fantastic opportunity for our patients and their families. Thanks so much, Kat. Thank you, Helen. Um, that was a really powerful presentation, emphasising how important it is for us all to, to be involved in this and it's part of all of our jobs. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for highlighting that. I think it really shows how we can improve things and change the story going forward if we're all involved.